that that stands in stark contradiction to your India's position on the Ukraine war, for example. Um, your moral compass held so high, but where women and children are murdered, our own Malaysian Airlines plane shot down in mid-air flying across Ukraine, and that an international court has found that the missile came from Russia. Why is not India taking a stronger stance against the violence, whether um, acted out by Russia or by Israel? You know, is, what is the contradiction between the, uh, the moral compass and the real politic? We follow your, your YouTube and TikTok messages, but very often you stand on uh, you, the Ukraine war, for example, seems ambiguous. Your biggest and strongest neighbor is China. Somehow, I always felt India and China should become the best of friends. Because when you become the best of friends, 90% of the world is under your hands. And uh, this is not something impossible. And what are the impediments that, that make you not to be friendly with China? My appeal today is, I have written to almost all the prime ministers earlier requesting one important thing. My great leader, Subhash Chandra Bose, his demise, his ashes are still in a foreign country. The man who gave the country actually expedited the process of transfer of power from Britain to India. One man, Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose. And I okay, the gentleman right in front of me here, that you will go first. Can somebody give the microphone to the other gentleman here? Right. My name is Baspan, founding secretary of the Malaysia India Business Council. Um, my question to the Honorable Minister, we sit here staring at the Ashoka Chakra, and Ashoka, after the Battle of Kalinga, denounced violence, said he will never fight again, and promoted peace. That, that stands in stark contradiction to your India's position on the Ukraine war, for example. Um, your moral compass held so high, but where women and children are murdered, our own Malaysian Airlines plane shot down in mid-air flying across Ukraine, and that an international court has found that the missile came from Russia. Why is not India taking a stronger stance against the, the violence, whether um, acted out by Russia or by Israel? You know, is, what is the contradiction between the, uh, the moral compass and the real politic? We follow your, your YouTube and TikTok messages, but very often you stand on uh, the Ukraine war, for example, seems ambiguous. Okay, we get Thank your you. point. Thank you, Mr. Baskarant. Next, um, I see uh, Professor Ramasamy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, uh, Excellent Affairs Minister. Dr. S. Jayashankar, for a wonderful speech. Uh, I am uh, not very sure when Congress was in power, that was the, uh, the aftermath of Nehruvian non-interference in the uh, affairs of other countries where the diaspora was located. But I think I see a difference after BJP, BJP came to power. And I still remember when Vajpai came to Malaysia, I think he did comment about the, the state of Indians in this country. 
So I think, uh, uh, sir, you were talking about the concerns, the, the concerns of the diaspora. So are you saying the diaspora, are these Indian nationals, say in uh, Ukraine, Indian nationals in the Middle East, or are you referring to th those Indians who are domiciled, who are citizens like you, us? But I have not, not seen, uh, and I think, I, you know, I, I must give credit to Modi and the BJP. I think the stand is a lot more different from the non-committal Congress regime. Yeah? But I see a difference. But yet to see the difference when you, especially in separating your overseas citizens and those who were first, our forefathers who migrated to this country and we have been treated shabbily in this country. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Raf. One more question from this side. Yes, YB. Excellency, uh, very eloquent speech you made, and I've heard you many times on social media. My interest always has been this, uh, something a bit different. Your biggest and strongest neighbor is China. Somehow, I always felt India and China should become the best of friends. Because when you become the best of friends, 90% of the world is under your hands. And uh, this is not something impossible. And what are the impediments that, that make you not to be friendly with China? And you know, China is a, a growing, uh, uh, one of the powerful countries in the world. And I, I, the little I know about Indian uh, policies, the amount of money spent on so many things just to get ready for the eventuality with them could be better spent on the people of India. Thank you. Um, let me, let me uh, start with the Ukraine question. You know, uh, as a, as a general principle, I say this as someone who's been, who spent a life dealing with foreign policy issues. It's very easy to be very sharply judgmental and actually say that this represents a high standard of ethics. It can be analytically very easily uh, displayed or projected in that manner. Look at the complexity of real life. We took the position from the start that you are not going to get a solution to this conflict on the battlefield. Two years have passed. There were many who felt two years ago or somewhere in between that maybe they could. I think today many of them don't any longer. If one sees, you know, in this day and age, what conflicts bring. There are actually no winners in a conflict. That at the end of the day, every party and a lot of innocent bystanders or other nations also get uh, ruined or affected one way or the other by con conflict. So our position has been here that find a way of bringing this conflict to an end. And very honestly, in some circles, this was not a very popular position at that time. But I say this to you very sincerely, as I travel around the world, and I look at countries far away, low-income countries, who found their food supplies cut off, who could not afford energy, who, f who could not secure their harvest because they could not get fertilizer, whose Trade was so disrupted, they didn't have money to settle the bills. Many of them are in debt. All this has happened as actually as an outcome of a conflict and nobody was even talking about it. So I think it's important here to life, I, you know, if life were binaries, very clearly uh, this is right and that is wrong and this is good and that is bad and this is the one you check and that's the one you cross out. Life would be incredibly simple. You actually, I don't know if you'll need foreign policy. You certainly won't need foreign ministers. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, I, I uh, want to say that, you know, in real life, I mean, you, you spoke about uh, the Israel 
uh, issue. Look, in a way, how different the pulls and pressures can be. On the one hand, what happened on October 7th was terrorism. On the other hand, nobody would, uh, you know, countenance the deaths of innocent civilians. Countries may be, uh, may be uh, justified, at least in their own minds, in responding. But you cannot have a response which does not, uh, uh, you know, uh, I mean, every response must take into account something called international humanitarian law. And the fact is that whatever the rights and wrongs of the issue, there is the underlying issue of the rights of the Palestinians and the fact that they have been denied their homeland. So, I mean, I'm taking that one issue and I've given you five different aspects of that issue. And somewhere a solution cannot be that I will pick two out of the five and leave three because you will not get a solution out of that. So, uh, the, the point is, you know, all of us who are in the, uh, I would say, the policy world who have to take those calls, we, st you know, much of our challenge is how do you get this balance right? That uh, we are today still one of the countries who are in a position, you know, where I, I go back to India tomorrow, I have the foreign minister of Ukraine visiting me uh, the day after that. We have also been the country who have uh, the opportunity to talk to the Russians very frankly and bluntly on this issue. On different aspects, you know, others have used us to pass messages. And by the way, the same thing applies when it comes to the Gaza-Israel uh, conflict as well. So, uh, I, I put it to you today, it's, this is not an issue of a moral cop-out. This is an issue today of appreciating that real life actually has a whole lot of complexities and that the uh, considered answers, the, the sustainable answers cannot be uh, very angular. They cannot pick some facets to the exclusion of other facets. On the diaspora uh, attitude, yes, I, look, I would say there has been a big change, no question. And uh, if I were to pick a moment of change, I would say it was probably Madison Square Garden. Uh, so when you had that kind of address by a prime minister to a diaspora, it, it sent its own message. Now, uh, what's, what's the issue in a way? This is, you know, diasporas, uh, by their very nature, uh, uh, it can be an issue of great sensitivity because their ethnicity or origin may be in one society, their domicile or their, uh, their nationality may be in another. But we need to get out of that debate of, you know, which one would you respect and how would you reconcile the two. We, if we actually approach the diaspora as a bridge, that, you know, for us today, the diaspora is an extraordinarily effective bridge to the rest of the world. That if we have today a, a particularly warm feeling towards Malaysia, a large part of it is because there's such a big diaspora here, the second largest diaspora that we have in the world. <laughs> and our, our uh, it, it should be our goal, you know, we should never put the diaspora ever in a dilemma that for us we should be supportive. There are many choices and many decisions the diaspora has to make. We cannot make those choices. You know, every community, once it has settled down somewhere in the world, will uh, judge its own interests and judge its own situation and take the right decisions. Our, our effort should always be supportive, should always be encouraging, should always actually strengthen the position of the diaspora as a living bridge. On the India-China uh, issue, look, every country wants good relations with its neighbors. Who doesn't? But every relationship has to be founded on some basis. Now, in the case of China, uh, our relationship has been difficult for a variety of reasons. 
including the fact that we have a boundary dispute. But despite the boundary dispute, over the many years, we actually built up a substantial relationship because we agreed that while we will negotiate the boundary dispute, both of us will agree that we will not bring soldiers in large numbers to the boundary and we will never have a situation where there'll be violence and bloodshed on the boundary. So this understanding which started in the 1980s actually was reflected in a number of agreements and those agreements gave the relationship the stability on the basis of which in other areas the relationship went forward. So, you know, uh, there was trade, there was investment, there was tourism, there was exchange of people in different walks of life. Now, unfortunately, for reasons which are still not clear to us, these agreements were broken in 2020, and we actually had violence and bloodshed on the border. So this is not a question of, you, are, you know, you're spending money on the China border which would be better spent on Indians. My first duty to Indians is to secure the border. I can never compromise on that. So we, we are today, we are today, you know, we are still negotiating with the Chinese. I talk to my counterpart, we meet from time to time, our military commanders negotiate with each other. But we are very clear that we had an agreement, we had, there is a line of actual control, uh, we have a, there is a, a tradition of not bringing troops to that line. Both of us have bases uh, some distance away, which is our traditional uh, deployment place. And we, we want that uh, normalcy. So that normalcy, that return to where we are in terms of the troop deployment will be the basis for the relationship going forward. And we've been very, very honest with the Chinese uh, about it. Okay, thank you. Uh, next round. For those who are putting up the hand on the far corners of this uh, hall, I'm unable to see because of the spotlight is glaring. So you, now for those who are, can you please move here to the center a bit? And okay, the gentleman over here, please. Uh, that's right. The thank next one is a lady. <laughs> thank you. My name is Surin from Sri Murugan Center, SMC. We are uh, among the largest Indian organization in the country. Your Excellency, first and foremost, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the government of India, in particular, the Ministry of External Affairs and the Indian High Commission for the numerous programs conducted for the diaspora in this country. Thank you very much. <laughs> Representing the youth, we would humbly request the programs such as the ITAC program that comes under your ministry to be enhanced and increased. And we assure you that the number of participation, we will fulfill it. Second, this may come under the uh, purview of Ministry of Home Affairs. But I would like to suggest, and when I heard your speech just now, when you said you have the Indians back, one of the things that uh, we are very proud of uh, calling ourselves Malaysians and also Indians. Having said that, one of the things that uh, we struggle here to get will be the OCI card. For many people here, the younger ones especially, they could be third generation. And for them to acquire the necess necessary documents may be difficult. My suggestion, if the youth that can join the programs by the Ministry of External Affairs be given a fast track or a levee where they will be, first and foremost, they must be a diaspora to be eligible for the program. Therefore, they should be given some privilege to apply for the OCI card without the normal uh, requirements. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, shall we go to this end? In, okay, please. J the lady with the sari. Thank you. Good evening, Your Excellency. My name is Nivia from the Malaysian Administrative Service. Uh, firstly, I would like to say congratulations for your inspiring leadership, putting India on the world stage of world politics. And my question to you, Your Excellency, would be in your book, um, The India Way, published in year 2020, 
a para in the lessons of Avad, where you ask, will the world continue to define India or will now India define itself? Four years down the road, and given India's upward trajectory and set to become the world's third largest uh, economy, how would you rephrase this statement now? Thank you. Okay, third question. Um, yeah, that lady over there, right? Finally, finally. Thank yeah. you so much. So, uh, thank you so much. I am Aradna Taktani from Times of India. And sir, welcome to Malaysia. I have uh, one question. I would have many questions, but I'll leave it at one. So uh, we talk about India and Malaysia having a civilizational connect and a uh, lot of people-to-people -people linkages, you know, and given that background, and given the fact that Malaysia is taking the ASEAN chair next year, what do you think will be giving the big momentum to your relations, bilateral ties, and second, also to the India-ASEAN relations going forward? Thank you. Um, uh, first, uh, the gentleman who asked me about uh, ITEC. Uh, yes, uh, I, you know, uh, we would be uh, uh, certainly happy to look at uh, deepening, expanding the ITEC program. Uh, wherever we find there is a good response, ITEC slots are used, there's a natural inclination to increase that, and I certainly, uh, tomorrow before I leave, I'll sit down with the High Commissioner uh, and talk to him about it. Uh, on the OCI, you know, this is a problem which is not unique uh, to Malaysia. Uh, there are some other places where documentation has been a real problem, and uh, uh, as generations pass, the problem becomes more acute. So if there is an issue here, uh, I know that in some other cases we have uh, kind of gone the extra mile to find a creative solution. Uh, I'll certainly be happy to uh, look at it and, uh, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we do not want people to be penalized because their circumstances were difficult at some point of time and somebody didn't keep the paper, which they may not have been at that position to either generate or to retain. So let me, let me look at it. I would like to understand the nature of the problem a little bit better, but I am by, by gut instinct sympathetic uh, to the request. Uh, on this question, you know, uh, what I said, which was, you know, the world defines us, and uh, today as we rise, how do we uh, define ourselves? So you would notice that the next book from India Way was called Why Bharat Matters. So I think that was my message that we have started defining ourselves. And we have started defining ourselves, I think, in a variety of ways, uh, partly by being uh, much uh, truer to our culture, tradition, civilization, by uh, being much more confident about it, uh, by not letting uh, you know, others uh, play mind games with us. Uh, you know, there are very clever ways today in, poli in world politics to kind of keep you down. Uh, so, uh, so a lot, of, but also by, by uh, taking our own decisions, you know. Because what happens, you know, when you don't have confidence, when you have grown up thinking that there is great wisdom in other parts of the world, everywhere except at your own home, then you tend naturally to, to import solutions. Now, I'm not saying everything imported is bad. I mean, there are many good things which can be imported. But if I, if I give you two examples, uh, you know, during COVID, uh, we got a lot of advice on how to financially respond to COVID. And a lot of the advice we got was actually not suitable to India, because we were very sure in the government that any uh, step we took, a financial measure we took, its benefits would actually not go down. And that it would be taken by uh, businesses or by uh, the intermediates uh, on the way. So we disregarded or we, we, we accepted, but you know, we listened, but we did not uh, accept. A lot of the advice came our way. We found our own solution. And at the end of it all, actually, when you looked at it, 
we found the right balance between fiscal responsibility and actually societal responsibility. That we were able even to provide food without actually creating a financial crisis, which a lot of people still marvel about. A second example is actually what happened in terms of our energy requirements once the Ukraine conflict started. You know, had we not stood our ground about buying uh, energy from Russia, very frankly, all of you would be paying much more for your energy because the, we would have, more countries would have gone into a narrow set of suppliers and actually raised the world's energy prices. So if I looked at it from the perspective of the global economy, uh, and frankly, obviously from my own perspective, we actually did the right thing. So this ability to think for yourself, to be comfortable with your identity, to be proud of your civilization, uh, to, be, to be appreciative of your own history, you know, not let your history be written by other people. I think these are all part today of defining ourselves. And I think that process is today why uh, that sense of Bharat is today uh, very much stronger in India. The, the question, you know, what could, uh, in our, if Malaysia, what could India, ASEAN be doing? Uh, I, I really, I think it would take more work for us really to come up with a certain specific set of uh, decisions on how we can deepen our relationship with ASEAN and Malaysia. We know the broad space where some of it is. I spoke about it, you know, say, these new technologies. We know there's more we can do digitally. We know that the sunrise industries offer us more possibilities. We know that greater mobility and more talent sharing is something uh, that will help us. Uh, even, you know, areas like uh, new energies, you know, green ammonia, green hydrogen, these can all be economic changes. Uh, we want, and but we're also looking at the soft side. You know, we want the people of India and Southeast Asia to appreciate, you know, our shared past, our common traditions, and uh, how to promote more tourism, travel, interactions, uh, young people's uh, uh, contacts. I think all these are part of the mix and I'm sure you will see something like that uh, emerge in the course of the next year. Thank you. Uh, next Prof. Round. Ravi, I'm so sorry. Uh, Your Excellency Prof. Ravi, I've been advised that uh, the Honorable Minister has to depart uh, now okay. for his next engagement. So we really have to wrap up uh, I'll, I'll, this I'll be, session. Uh, I'll stretch it a bit. Maybe we'll just take two questions since he raised the mic. He shouldn't disappoint people. So, we'll just take two questions. Thank okay. you, sir. The last question. Now, who do I select? Who do I choose? Ah, the gentleman over here. So, okay. Please. Uh, yeah. Hello. Good evening. I'm the pre I'm, my name is Murli. I'm president of Bharat Club Kuala Lumpur. Just, I wanted to know, as an NRI, uh, when will we get right to vote out here in Kuala Lumpur. The election is nearing. Is there any chance? The second question is... Uh, only one question, please. Oh, just one small thing. Uh, uh, we are very glad that we have got an entry-free visa into Malaysia. All our relatives can come. We want that to be, you know, our ranking on passport validity should shoot up. And maybe, God willing, in your next five-year tenure, we want it to be in top 20 or 25. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry I have to stop because I'm going to ask the last, last question. <laughs> I deserve the right as a moderator. Okay, I will let go. <laughs> please. He, he yeah. can sit. No, no, no. Better, better he sit down. and ask. Yeah, yeah, please. A lot of questions have been asked and beautiful answers have been given. Very proud to hear our external minister's explanation about India today. Very proud. But all these, all these things are happening. How? 
my appeal today is I have written to almost all the prime ministers earlier requesting one important thing. My great leader, Subhash Chandra Bose, his demise, his ashes are still in a foreign country. The man who gave the country actually expedited the process of transfer of power from Britain to India. One man, Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose. And I see his ashes are so many years already, thank you, years already. His ashes are still in a foreign country. There are many people having monuments and whatnot in India. I'm very sad to say this. And now I'm appealing to uh, His Excellency, Dr. S. Jai Shankar. I'm, I have full confidence in him. And I know that he will make some effort to tell the government of India to bring Netaji's ashes from Japan, from bring Koji Temple from Japan back to New Delhi. If they cannot, then we will do something else. Sorry for delaying. Anyway, thanks. Thank, I wish to thank uh, the minister very much for what he did. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you so much. Uh, uh, the minister has graciously agreed uh, to receive and one more question from me as a closing. Um, you know, I would like to ask you about um, how does India seize its own aspiration and that expression of that aspiration as perhaps a regional leader or a global leader? Are we going to see a Pax Indica in the next 10 years? Thank you. Um, on, the, on the NRI uh, voting, you know, uh, right now, uh, obviously, I mean, you, you were speaking about uh, election, which is a few weeks away. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the current rules are the ones which uh, would be applied uh, here. Uh, I think the challenge uh, when it comes to NRI's voting in, that, in the country of domicile uh, uh, is uh, partly one of uh, the, the process. You know, how do you actually get that done? Because remember, this is electronic uh, voting. Uh, partly an issue of numbers, because we already have about 17, 18 million Indian nationals abroad in different countries. Uh, you cannot pick some countries and not have other countries. So, you, you know, Indians are all over the world, so it has to be, in a sense, uh, non-discriminatory uh, as well. So it's actually an issue which has a lot of complications to it. Uh, it is something which, uh, uh, ha which continues to be debated and considered. We have to see whether in some way technology can find fixes which uh, right now look uh, uh, otherwise very, very daunting. Uh, on your question, as, as to, to uh, end the discussion in a way, uh, look, India is today, uh, as I said, fifth largest economy, third largest very soon. Uh, if one looks at some of the uh, studies and forecasts, uh, uh, there is a uh, forecast that uh, by uh, 2047, uh, we will we will actually uh, cross the 30 billion dollar, 30 trillion dollar level, and by 2075, we would actually be the second biggest. The Goldman Sachs says that we'll be the second biggest economy at 52.5. So those are the trends. Now we can argue. I mean, a lot of things happen in real life, but there's no question today that there is a certain momentum. There is a certain uh, growth, uh, and uh, there is certain confidence that this will be maintained uh, there. That's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is uh, the demographics. Uh, we are today the mo most populous country, but if you look at it, 
Again, median age is still not very high. So many of the concerns which other uh, societies have had uh, about going gray very early are not necessarily concerns which India would have uh, to that extent. The third is the nature of the world itself. You know, we today talk so uh, confidently and rightly so, saying, okay, we are entering an AI era, we are talking chips, uh, you know, we are talking very deep, deep technologies. All of which means that, uh, in a way, uh, the metrics of power, you know, we are no longer talking necessarily how much money do you have in your national treasury and how, how big is your army. Uh, there are many other uh, metrics of influence which will happen. So if you ask me, uh, uh, do, uh, do, I, do I envision uh, this rise of India and am I planning for it? My answer to you would be a yes. So we do talk today, even amongst ourselves in India, saying, look, we will be a leading power and we have to prepare for a global footprint because, you, you know, a, you cannot suddenly one day turn on a switch and say, I want to be global. It's a very, very steady, gradual process of actually uh, establishing uh, your footprint around the world. But having said that, why, where I would differ uh, with you on uh, the idea of a Pax Indicana, the reality is the world is a very diverse place. There are today uh, almost 200 countries in the world. Pax anything, Pax Americana, I mean, any Pax of a country is actually a distortion of that diversity. It is when one country or one power goes out and dominates other countries, uh, often at great cost to the world and to those countries. That's how you got a Pax Britannica or you got a Pax, uh, uh, yeah, Pax Romana. So we would favor actually diversity, what we call multipolarity. We think that different regions, different countries must have their fair share. You know, being, uh, we, we had, uh, my, my first question was on this issue of, do you have a moral view? To me, a moral view would actually be a just view of the world, that every region, every country has a fair share in global decision making. They're all stakeholders uh, in what we live. And I, I think that would be much more in tune with Indian tradition, with Indian outlook towards life. We are by nature a pluralistic uh, people. Uh, we, you know, we, we, we uh, even, we, you know, our own traditions have not been that kind of domination of a Pax uh, whatever it is. So I think that would be the vision, in my view, that we should, we should really share with the world. Uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, uh, Your Excellency. Uh, that's all the time that we have for today. I would like... The world is today a much more complicated place. It is more turbulent, it is more volatile. We have seen, for example, the impact that COVID has had on all of us. All of us, just not personally, but as societies, as countries, uh, the enormous disruptions that it caused. We are still experiencing today uh, what happens when there is conflict anywhere in the world. That in this day and age, conflicts can no longer be contained in that particular geography. Uh, that uh, whether it is what is happening in Ukraine, or what is happening in the Red Sea, uh, that uh, something far away has a very uh, disruptive implication uh, for our lives. We see every day what happens when, when uh, climate events happen, that climate today is disrupting food production, uh, that uh, uh, if you know, uh, uh, prices go up or shortages happen, some of it is certainly an uh, 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 issue of markets, but a lot of it is also the implications of changes in nature. So why I mention this is when India and Malaysia prepare for an era of closer relationship. I think we have to bear in mind that we are together actually contemplating a much more difficult world than the one we have grown up with in the last generation. 
and one way by which we can be of great uh, support to each other is really to build on these very special factors of our ties. The fact that we trust each other, the fact that on crucial matters we've been reliable for each other, the fact that in many ways, both physically and I would say culturally, emotionally, we are much closer to each other. So today, when countries actually are working out partnerships, many of these partnerships are actually based on this sense today of trust, of closeness, of reliability. And this is the world in which we are living in, and this for us is actually a new opportunity to refashion ties with each other. Now, having said that, I also know <clears throat> that it is natural that for uh, our diaspora anywhere in the world, there's great interest on what is happening in the world, or what is happening in, at home. I think some, most of you know what is happening in the home. So we have uh, some uh, big decisions to make uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, and uh, at least uh, as someone who has uh, uh, a clear interest and participation in it, I will leave that matter there. But having said that, I think there are other things which are happening at home. Perhaps the most important is that uh, India has rebounded from the COVID, that we are today one of the fastest growing large economies in the world, that we are back to that 7% growth rate. And when you look at that today, uh, the, 10 years ago, uh, we were the 11th largest economy in the world. Today, we are the fifth. In the next few years, we'll probably be the third. So w that sense of momentum today and the confidence that comes from it, the greater production, the greater consumption, uh, that uh, ability, you know, you can actually feel uh, today that buzz and energy uh, in India, which is uh, driven by a very strong economy. But it's not just growth. It's also what kind of growth. And one of the big changes which we have seen is that uh, growth has actually been very much more inclusive than in the past. That it is not just big cities that are growing. It is not just the, uh, uh, the question of, you know, uh, uh, the uh, numbers uh, of a nation. You can actually see this percolate down uh, to, the, to the furthest corner in the most uh, effective manner. And a large part of that is because today uh, growth for us and governance for us is driven very much by digital technology. That India's embrace of technology in the last 10 years has actually been a game changer. And the, you know, when one looks at the scale of that, and uh, this was something I was discussing with the Prime Minister here today, that one of the basic obligations of any government, anyway, is to make sure that those in need in their societies, that they get the requirements that they want. But the challenge for the government, for any government, is to make sure that it goes to the right people, that it doesn't go to the wrong people, and it doesn't get siphoned off. And that's actually been the challenge, uh, particularly in India, which we have grappled with for many, many years. But today, whether it is food support, which two thirds of our population actually gets on a regular basis, uh, whether it is uh, today uh, loans for uh, people to uh, start their own business, which one third of the country gets, whether it is today free or subsidized health access, which more than a third of the country gets. When you look today at uh, housing, uh, you know, uh, houses which are built by the uh, government and given uh, to, uh, to the vulnerable people, you are actually today looking at massive numbers and the right numbers, the right people are actually getting the benefit. And 
one of the comparisons which I make is many of these programs, they are today the size of the population of countries, sometimes the size of the population of multiple continents. So when we speak about food support, we are talking 815 million people who day in, day out, actually get their rations from the government, who are therefore assured that whatever happens, whatever happens in the world, whatever happens in India, they will never go hungry, their nutrition and health levels are protected. Or when we speak today about giving loans, especially a lot of these loans go to women, we are talking of 400, 450 million loans. Even housing, there are today 200 million people in India who have got houses in the last 10 years from the government. 200 million people is one and a half times the population of Japan. Even, you know, many of you would be familiar with the fact that people were using firewood in the kitchen and the health damage that it was doing. Now, when these were replaced by gas cylinders, the beneficiaries of that are 90 million people. That's like actually dealing with entire Germany's kitchen problem at one point. So think about it. You know, the scale of the change, the, the population, the, the uh, lowest and the, the people who actually were the most uh, in, in uh, need, uh, lowest in terms of income, and uh, the, the cumulative impact of all of this is that actually 250 million people have come out of poverty. And as, as you can actually sense that, you know, movement uh, up. But while all of that is happening, other changes are taking place as well. And I think those of you who, uh, who uh, go to India regularly would see it. One of the big changes is actually in infrastructure. Now, to be honest with you, there was a time we used to come to Malaysia and admire the infrastructure here. We still do. Uh, but today, you know, you can see those changes in India. That uh, we are building, we have built 10 years ago, there were 75 airports in India. Today, there are 150. We have built nine to 10 air, new airports every year for the last 10 years. Every two years, three cities in India actually get new metros. And every day, and I say this with a country with whom we have a good road building history, every day, 28 kilometers of highways are made. So this is actually the change also, which is taking place in India. That change is not just in you know, the physical appearance and the physical assets of the country. The other big transformation is actually today in the quality of the people. That if one looks at the education, starting actually from the school, I would even say preschool, you know, uh, as, as a member of parliament, you know, all of us have uh, funds which we give for a particular constituency for development work to take place. In, my, in the, in the uh, district which I uh, focus on, one of my objectives which, which I support is something called smart anganwadis, which is preschool, where you actually start little kids with digital skills very, very early. So it starts very early. It, you know, whether it is schools, and you also know that one of the challenges of schools was also the toilet issue. Uh, which fortunately by now has become history. But school retention, you know, the fact we want people not just to start schooling but carry on, then to ensure that the, the gender balance, you know, again, we, the, you know, the, there was a big gap which we have at last closed between girls' attendance and boys' attendance in schools. Then when you look beyond schools, at uh, challenges which you are also familiar with, skills, vocational training, universities, colleges, medical, engineering. And each one of this has actually taken off. In the, again, I give you a figure which, which I would ask you to reflect on. The last 
10 years has seen 7,000 new colleges in India, which means two colleges a day have come up in India. That would give you that, that sense really uh, of transformation. And it's not again just a, you know, a multiplication of institutions. As someone who visits a lot of these places, I can actually see the difference in behavior. The fact that young people today are more innovative, that people still in, in, in college, sometimes even in high school, are talking about taking out patents, that people in college have even their startups. So the, 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 today the levels of confidence, the, the mood, the progress, the sense that a lot has been achieved, that is today very, very strong. And in each domain, it has found some expression. People in business would certainly say it's much easier to do business in India. It's still far from perfect, I quite uh, accept that. But I think there's no question that we, have, we are definitely moving uh, in the right direction. I think for the general public, for the general public, the ease of living has also improved uh, uh, tremendously. That if, in fact, one of the issues which we are constantly asked to uh, look at is how do we, what are the old laws and old regulations that we don't need anymore. Every department actually for the last few years has, because typically in the bureaucracy you love to add rules and regulations. I know that, all of you know that as well. But to actually get people to say, look at what is antiquated, what is unnecessary today. Why do we need the verification, you know? And, and some of it, for example, have, can be very simple. You know, the idea of a self-affidavit that you sign, you are responsible for a document. It makes perfect sense. It works 99.99% of the time. So how do we today uh, ease the burden of unnecessary regulations and over compliance uh, on uh, average citizen? And you can see that in services. Today paying income tax in India, actually not just paying, getting a refund. You know, it's so much faster. Uh, at, sometimes it's a matter of a few weeks. Or passports, that what used to take months, actually uh, today takes weeks, sometimes even days. So the, the, uh, the picture which I'm trying to communicate to you today is really of a far more confident nation, uh, far more optimistic about its future, very much more capable that when we speak today, uh, you know, of today's India, we are actually talking of a Chandrayaan moon landing. We are talking of a 5G technology telecom stack. We are talking of making our own vaccines and inventing uh, our own vaccines. We are talking today of, you know, technologies like drones. We are talking of chips. So uh, the, the uh, these, you know, as, as people whose uh, hearts and minds are very often back home, uh, I do want you to appreciate that there has been a very, very solid foundation that has been laid. And this foundation uh, is likely to actually take us into a much higher trajectory and a higher orbit in the times to come. Now, uh, I've dwelt a little bit at what happened at home. Let me speak a little bit also about what happens in the world and how do we respond to that. I referred to the impact of the COVID, and I did so because, quite honestly, I don't think any of us could have, one, imagined anything so devastating, and surely in all our livelihoods, uh, in all our lives, we, you know, we'd, we'd never really uh, have to go through something like this again. But it was a time of enormous test. And when we responded to the world, we, of course, did so trying to build up our own capabilities, but we also did so trying to respond to the world's capabilities. And the fact is that a country, when the COVID started, the world was worrying how this country would fare. After a year and a half, this was the country which was actually supplying vaccines to 99 other countries across the world. Now, 
COVID was an enormous disruption, but it's not the only one. We, I, I spoke about conflicts, you know, what, what's happening in Ukraine, what's happening in Gaza, and what happened in Sudan some months ago. Now, what does it do for a country which has such a large diaspora, which has so many of its citizens working abroad, studying abroad, traveling abroad, it actually creates a situation of exceptional responsibility. So one part of it is, you know, what you respond to the world, yes, by helping uh, and contributing to that particular need. But you also respond to the world where your own citizens are concerned. And what we have seen in recent times is that wherever today, wherever today, you know, our community is in distress, where they are in danger, we are there to secure their back. And you saw that, you, you saw that in uh, Ukraine during Operation Ganga, in Sudan, Operation Kaveri, in Israel during Operation Ajay. Uh, we had it in Afghanistan, Devi Shakti. So even, even recently, we, had, we are having a situation, it's not a big deal, but for the people who are involved, it is very big, that there are a few families who were stuck in Haiti. Uh, so uh, today we have given our diaspora, our community, that sense of confidence that go out in the world, do what is obviously good for yourself, but we are there behind you. And I would put it to you that that is not a small achievement. Now, when, when a country rises, because as we get bigger, we are approaching a four trillion dollar economy, uh, we, our capabilities are growing, it is also natural that expectations of India will grow. So, uh, you can't have the rewards without the responsibilities. That if we want to be well regarded in the world, we also have today to get ready to take the responsibilities of the world. And that is something today that the country is stepping up to. That uh, on a whole range of situations, it could be natural disasters, it could be earthquakes somewhere, it could be a civil war in Yemen, uh, earthquakes like you had in Nepal or Turkey. Or it could be like what is happening in the Red Sea. That today, actually, there are 21 ships of the Indian Navy who every day work there to keep shipping secure. That they have actually rescued from pirates, from drone and missile attacks, a number of ships, crewmen, including some from uh, this region, who have, uh, who every day undertake the searching and boarding and searching which is necessary really to keep the maritime uh, traffic there safe. So uh, the, the, uh, the sense I want to share with you today, uh, yes, we are changing, we are growing at home, uh, many, many uh, transformational uh, developments are happening. But we will also see an India which will step out more in the world which will contribute, contribute through the power of its production, through the power of its capability, sometimes through the power of its ideas. That it may, it may be something like propagation of solar energy. You know, we, we founded something called the International Solar Alliance. Or it could be something like changing our lifestyle. It's a power of the idea there that you can actually fight climate change by adopting a much more climate friendly lifestyle. Even changing our food habits. The propagation, for example, of millets. Millets as a way which is because it consumes less water, it is greener, it is more nutritious. So in different ways, even wellness, yoga. I mean, if you see in the last decade, uh, when we do the International Day of Yoga, actually today we track beginning from the international date line all the way through, and there's not a single country in the world which doesn't actually celebrate yoga, and which doesn't today realize the value of yoga. So this, you know, the power of uh, the economy, the power of 
a greater contribution, the power of ideas, and the power of being fair, of being, of doing the right thing. Uh, because uh, last year we had the presidency of the G20, and we used that presidency to actually ensure that the global south uh, got uh, what was the uh, what was the right thing for them. That many of their issues that they were not left behind uh, in the world's uh, progress, march towards progress and prosperity. Uh, and uh, it could be the African Union's membership, uh, but, but it was also uh, equally the real bread and butter issues today of the world. You know, how do you deal with debt? How do you deal with trade disruptions? How do you deal with currency problems? That a lot of countries today can't trade because they don't have access uh, to the right currency in the right volumes. So uh, this uh, fairer India, more responsible India, more contributive India. That is today the India, I think, which engages Malaysia. So I am very convinced that today we are actually, India and Malaysia, we are poised uh, to take our relationship to the next level. I think very serious conversations are happening among policymakers to that end. But uh, anything like this requires the full support of society, uh, especially in countries where we have this kind of living bridge uh, between us. Uh, all of you, in some way or the other, can contribute to it in your particular professions, in your walk of life. You can also make a difference adding to this relationship. And that is why you have seen uh, today how open we are, uh, how appreciative we are, uh, of the contribution of the diaspora. So let me again conclude uh, by, by uh, today thanking all of you. You have taken time out uh, from your busy schedules to come here. But I do want to say that, you know, for us, each one of you in some way makes a difference. When we speak about a relationship, relationships are not built by impersonal entities. Uh, they're not the product just of statements and uh, goodwill. They are actually brick by brick, uh, something which is built by real people in a very meaningful and practical way. Those are people like you. Uh, and once again, I uh, want to uh, express my appreciation for all the support uh, that you have given it. And I ask you, please keep doing it. Thank you once again. Namaskar.